You're listening to the Cowbell Kingdom Podcast, brought to you by Jiffy Lube. Jiffy Lube, fast and convenient automotive services with over 25 locations in the area. Visit them at JiffyLubeCA.com for coupons and locations today. Now, here's your host, James Ham. Welcome to the Cowbell Kingdom Podcast, brought to you by Jiffy Lube. I am James Ham, and joining me today is one of the Sacramento Kings fans' fan favorites, Miss Katie Christensen. Katie, how are you? I'm doing fantastic. How are you? I'm good. Uh, you know, we are recording this on Wednesday for Friday's podcast, but uh, Sacramento right. Kings fall to Houston. Uh, not a great game by anyone. What are your initial thoughts just on how that game went and sort of the flow of it? You know, I think that one of the things, one of the keys for that game for me was the Kings to be able to take care of the ball. Um, they're obviously playing with some injury issues and some people are having to step up and Ramon Sessions and Omri Caspi with, with Collison and Gay out. But, you know, Houston is a team that the, their, their offense is scoring points off the fast break or from long range. Tonight they, they had only eight points from the mid-range you know, area. So it's, it's either all points in the paint or from beyond the arc. So you know, the, the fact that they turned the ball over the way they did, I think it was like nine turnovers for 16 points in that first quarter, that kind of made it really difficult on the second night of a back-to-back for them to overcome that. But what I liked, what I saw, which is, is continuing to impress me about this team, James, is the fact that you know, if this were a year ago, a team like that would have folded. And this, this Kings team this year um, really is doing a fantastic job of fighting through adversity and not getting up and uh, giving up and not getting rattled. And I think that's really important because um, they played a really tough schedule early on. And to see that they're, that it seems to become something that we expect from them instead of surprise when we see it. Yeah, I would agree. It is. It's kind of refreshing, isn't it, to come into a game and it doesn't matter how hard they get punched early on. They just seem to grind it out and get right back in it. Yeah, you know, and and it's it's funny that way because, you know, this team last year it was it was quite a different story and we've seen this team get down big um like they did in Phoenix, like they did tonight and come back and have a shot to win it or to win it in double overtime like they did in Phoenix, but we've also seen them build big leads in the first quarter, like in, in Memphis and in Dallas, and then give up those leads. But um, it's it's refreshing because the first time in a long time, it, regardless of how the flow of the game is going, I don't give up hope on this team, which is really nice. It is, it is. So let's get to a couple of negatives, I would say, before we, we break into some of the positive things. What is going on with Ramon Sessions? Because he has yeah. been a solid NBA player, and all of a sudden, I mean, tonight yeah. – he couldn't even dribble the ball. I don't even know what's going on with him. I mean, it, he looks like he's lost, you know, not only he, – he almost looks like he's in uh, Space Jam. Like someone sucked the Ramon Sessions out of him and sent, him in, sent it into space. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's interesting because a lot of people are really down on him right now. And like you said, he is a, he is a proven NBA vet that has, has done a, a great job of making a career as a role player in this league. And he played so well for the Kings during the preseason, but has really struggled over this first month of the season. Um, and I think that coach has been giving him the nod because he does have that veteran experience and he's allowing, you know, he's giving the first opportunity to the veterans. Um, but I, I wouldn't be surprised, especially, you know, Friday against uh, San Antonio to see maybe Ray McCallum get the start um, defensively on Tony Parker, I think would be the, the main thing. But when it comes to Ramon, it's really difficult because one thing that I know for sure coming from the player side of things, um, there's a lot of things that can happen. These, these guys are people like everybody else. And there are a lot of things, you know, that can happen in someone's life that it could be something that they're going through, a family issue, um, things like that that we don't necessarily know as members of the media or as fans. But at the same time, players also have slumps. And this could very well just be a slump for him and hopefully something that he works out of. But it's hard for me when people are so brutal to him and there's some of the stuff that people send me on social media and stuff. Like I understand their frustration but I also understand what it, what it's like to be on the other side and and be struggling and and have a hard time. And I can't imagine I didn't play in a time during social media that might, that might have been, you know, ten times worse than than you know going through a slump when I was playing. 
Yeah, it's just absolutely brutal. I mean, the fans can be brutal. I mean, even I, I mean, I, I have a hard time as a media member not taking pop shots at him. Still, you know, I I, I think I tweeted yeah. out that you know he needs to go in at the locker room at halftime and and have his hands checked for butter. I mean, it was just like. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I do want to say this. I do want to point this out from a from a realistic standpoint. Um, Demarcus had seven turnovers tonight. Yes, and yes. something with with Collison being out and Ramon taking over, Darren or um, Demarcus has has also taken on a lot of the the load of trying to be a playmaker. We saw in that third quarter against New Orleans uh, on Tuesday what he was able to do in terms of running the break and uh, initiating the offense. And so I think that, you know, you've got to look at both of them. Tonight, if you're looking at it from a pure basketball standpoint, I have to give so much credit to, to Houston because what they did is, A, they've improved defensively tenfold since last year. Mm-hmm. And it's not a pretty defense. I don't look at it as an organized defense. I look at it as a chaotic defense. And basically what they do is they get into lanes. They send a bunch of people. They have active hands. And when it comes to it and there's, you know, three guys coming at DeMarcus and he's trying to dribble through this mess – Yes, he's turning the ball over. And no, the officials aren't going to call it because you can't call that every time down the floor. And I felt like a lot of that was happening with Ramon where there was things where he was trying to dribble through through traffic. Sometimes, yes, he just lost the handle. But I think that, you know, you've got to give credit to Houston for making it difficult in that sense. All right, let's talk about two guys that were here the first time you were around the team, uh, you know, a few years ago, and then you left and now you're back. But Jason Thompson and Omri Caspi, they're like your lovable guys. They're two of the nicest guys you're going to run into <laughs> in an NBA locker room. They're good guys off the court. I mean, you know, they've got good spirits about them. They're, they're almost like brothers uh, when you get around them, like as when they're together. But both of them have had awakenings in completely different ways this season. And I don't think Jason Thompson is getting nearly enough credit. I think Omri Caspi is getting some notice, but I don't yeah. – you know, maybe not nationally. But Jason Thompson, what he's been able to do is absolutely remarkable to me, how he's reinvented himself. I mean, was he had – is this his fifth coach that he's played for? He just keeps having to reinvent himself. But this time, he's mm-hmm. reinvented himself in a new, like, really solid way as a defender, and it's really shocking to me. Well – Okay, I, I'm glad that you point that out because today, for example, when I was prepping for this game, I was at a coffee shop and I was reading all the clips and all this you know, stuff that's been written. And the Kings are getting a ton of attention now because of the way that they've started the season. And it, it, it really surprises me the number of, of articles that I read that were crediting DeMarcus with his defense on Anthony Davis um, against New Orleans and holding him to you know, 9 of 14 from the floor. And after he had gone off and scored 40-something points you know, the game before. And night in and night out, Jason Thompson is going to draw the toughest post matchup. Um, on the defensive end. And the reality of it is, is because DeMarcus spends so much energy on the offensive end of the floor and they need him for that. But also he's not as good of a defender as, as Jason. And yes, he's made huge strides, but you don't want to put your go-to scorer in situations where when they're already foul prone, that they're having to, to have those matchups. So Jason looks at this as something that he can contribute. And I'm telling you, this is a guy that came out of a a smaller school, came out a writer. He wasn't a a particularly high pick. He wasn't well-known necessarily. And he has found a way to make his way in the NBA and have job security. And the way that he's done that, it's not just this year, but it's, the last several years he's he's become a really solid defender and I mean I remember last year against Kevin Love and what he was able to do and night in and night out Jason's done this for a long time but there's a couple differences now a the team's defense has really improved along with it so in a team setting I think that just highlights you know what Jason's able to do as a one-on-one defender but also the team's winning and when you look at that that you know it's like oh he might be a great defender but if his team's not winning then who cares so i'm glad that you point that out because still a lot of people don't get that and a lot of fans but it's okay you know it's okay i think it's that's how jason has a job and he's very valuable to this team and you've been in the locker room um james and you hear the players giving him you know tons of credit yes for for what he does on the defensive end you know uh, let's talk about omos caspi from turkey <laughs> 
I was pissed about that. Yeah, uh, I was yeah, furious. Just random, isn't it crazy? Yeah. How, uh, you know, every once in a while you can mess up a name, but to just be all over the board. Omri Caspi, and again, a sweetheart of a kid, a very, very good guy. And what he's done is he's abandoned his mid range game, which was a disaster for him as a player. And he's either running at the rim or he's shooting an occasional three. How have you seen him develop over the years at watching from, you know, from when you saw him as a young player to where he is now, mm-hmm. you know, still only a 26 year old guy? Yeah. You know, I think it's interesting. Uh, Omri I, has developed in a lot of ways. He has one of the show, uh, the slowest three point shots that I've ever seen. <laughs> he brings it from his knees. It takes him about 10 seconds to get it off. He's not getting a lot of threes because that is easy to run out at. You can close out on him very easily. But he is starting to get some threes as of late because the Kings' ball movement have improved so much. So when they're getting a couple quick passes and swings, it's giving him a little bit more time to get his shot off. But to me, that's not his strength. His strength really is his ability to get into the paint. And he, he struggled for a while there in the preseason, wasn't finishing very well well around the basket it's gotten a lot better but he does a tremendous job of just putting pressure on defenses by getting into the paint he's got that euro sidestep down and and it changes it's never the same so he's really difficult to defend um he gets to the free throw line and he goes in there and does the things that are the intangibles the diving you know after balls the the things that don't show up on a stat sheet necessarily but he's got that ability to be like a spark club for that team off the bench and that's really important and when you sit down as a coach and you look at your rotations and how, who who you're going to sub in and who's starting and what groups play best together these are all things that factor into it that a lot of people don't realize and you need that person that can come off the bench and that's been Omri and with Rudy out, you know, what he did against, you know, New Orleans, it shows that he has potential to be a, a really good steady scorer in this league. But at the same time, he's kind of like Jason and where he fits into whatever role you need him to do. All right. You are listening to the Cowbell Kingdom podcast brought to you by Jiffy Lube. I'm James Ham. with me, Katie Christensen. And we're talking Omri Caspi. Uh, I, you know, I don't know why, but I can't stop talking about how much he's changed and how how he's evolved as a player and watching him step up into Rudy Gay's role. It has it surprised you how he seamlessly done it. And not only that, but he's still shooting, you know, seven of 11, five of seven. He's not yeah. doing anything that's outside of the realm of who he is as a player. You know, it doesn't surprise me. Uh, and I can't remember who wrote it. And, and I don't know, James, maybe you wrote it. I read something uh, a while ago talking about kind of the change in him over the years. And he, he sat down with a, a journalist and was talking about his first year was really difficult for him because, you know, obviously being the, the first, you know, Israeli player in the NBA and he comes out and there's all of these expectations and there's these people in his ear. And I think he also got a little bit, you know, as my parents would say, too big for his britches um, and got away from really what got him there. And he was more enjoying the lifestyle than, you know, continuing to grow as a player. And I think that's one of the biggest differences in him is that he is better as a professional on and off the floor. He's grown. He's paying attention. He, he's going back to working with some, some people that he worked with younger in his career to get back to the things that he does well. And I think the hardest thing for players um, – to, like Omri, to stay in this league and be effective and be, you know, productive is to really be honest with themselves about what they do well and what they don't do well. You want to continue to progress and try and work on the things that you don't do well because you want to become a well-rounded player, but you also need to be honest and say, this is what I absolutely know that I bring, and you want to bring that every night. And I think that that's what Omri's doing. All right, we can we can skip past Omri for now, um, but you have some new things that you're doing with Sacramento Kings. I know you have a new show, King Central, which is a um, a monthly magazine type show. You've got to travel with the team to to China, and how much are you loving this new regime and and sort of the new feel and vibe around <laughs> this team since you've been back? You know, it's so different because I I you know when I left before it was. Um, 
it was really sad to leave. And I got such a great, uh, the fans here have really always supported me in such a great way. And, and the people that hired me when I was here before and the people that I worked with absolutely supported me. It was more of an ownership issue when it came down to what happened with me leaving. Um, despite the fact that nothing you know crazy happened, it's just they wanted to go in a different direction and, and weren't a big fan of mine. Um, which is fine. That's basically what you're doing when you're in, in broadcasting. Not everyone's going to like you, and that's how it is. So coming back and being in this environment, it's so different. And I really appreciate not only Vivek, but this entire ownership group, because they're, they're fans, but they're professionals at the same time. And they, they want to, they're truly committed to building this product and to making this a competitive team. But at the same time, they're not lost in, in the fact that, you know, they're multi-millionaires, billionaires that own a team. They're enjoying the ride like the fans do. And I think that's really nice um, from my end because I get to see them be excited with this team as they're getting more and more successful as they go. Yeah, it seems like this group here is a lot more human. They're easier to relate to. <laughs> maybe, maybe not so much Vivek. Uh, not to not to call Vivek out, but maybe not so much Vivek. But guys like Andy Miller, guys, you know, like mm -hmm. Philo. I mean, some of these people are they're almost like family already. And you're like, how did this happen mm -hmm. so quickly? They're such good people. And again, I mean, I'll say it. You don't have to say it. What a colossal mistake to go with Jim Gray and uh, <laughs> Bill Walton. <laughs> and to uh, sort of chase chase your way down to uh, Anaheim is what I think the plan was there. So they had guys yeah. in place, but uh, what a, what a horrible mistake. So hey, I don't want to keep you all night. I know it's the night before Thanksgiving, and I'm sure you've got major plans tomorrow. But this team is developing. It's a lot of fun to watch. How good can they be? What are what are your thoughts on just how good this group can be together going forward? Well, honestly, I'll tell you right now, I am completely shocked in the turnaround that they've been able to do. I knew they would be a better team this year, but how quickly they're developing in terms of, and their chemistry, I think is probably the one thing to me that is the most important thing here. I mean, how this team has come together. And that actually tells me a little bit about some of the personalities that were on this team last year, where we weren't really sure what the problem was, but now that some people are gone and this team has come together like they have it, it as a player, I absolutely know what that says. And that says that there was some people in the locker room last year that created some issues to where this team couldn't come together the way they needed to, because they have talent. Obviously they had three 20 plus a night scores last year and you're scratching your head going, what's going on. Um, but I, I think that they can do and could do some really amazing things this season. I don't want to say playoffs because the West is so competitive, but at the rate that they're going, they're able to accomplish something along the lines of a Phoenix last year who barely missed the playoffs, Portland who shocked everybody. Um, and especially with injuries, you know, injuries are the most important thing in the NBA because some of these great Western conference teams like Oklahoma city, who it's like, if they don't get Westbrook and Durant back, their season actually might be over already. And we're a month into the season, you know? So in LA, the Clippers have not been playing particularly well. I've been kind of shocked at, at what they're doing. Um, so you never really know what's going to happen, but if they continue to get better at the rate that they are, I don't want to say playoffs, but it's a possibility in the whole scheme of things. You know, I'm not calling it. I'm not, I'm not going to put that in people's heads. But the great thing about sports, you never know. <laughs> you never know. So you're saying They have playoffs. the potential if they continue and they stay healthy. I think it's an absolute potential, you know, when you look at the, some of the ways things are playing out early in the season in the West. Yeah, and I'll point out to you the shocking thing to me is not only are they in a conversation – but this team's been together like a little bit over seven weeks. And how could, I, I mean, who knew they could gel so quickly? I mean, you look yeah. at Memphis, who's been together, their starting five's been together literally like five or six years. I mean, most of the teams they're going up against have, have like yeah. grown together and, and started to take the major strides that you typically do see as an NBA team, you know, from uh, from good team to great team to sustaining greatness. Mm -hmm. So, 
Well, anyway, thank you so much for joining uh, joining me tonight on the Cowbell Kingdom podcast. Uh, it, this is the second time we've had you on, but it's always a pleasure. Oh, thanks. I have a fantastic holiday. Um, I hope to, to God that the month of December, which when I was looking at the schedule today for the Kings, not only are they home a lot more than they have been this month in November, but they also have um, uh, not as difficult of a schedule. So hopefully, you know, we'll have a good Thanksgiving and then we can come back to a good month of December. How about that, James? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think we're going to be BFFs next month. It's like 11, 11 home games. We'll just like yeah. we'll just be camping out there. It's just going to be ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, you're going to get tired of seeing my face, James. Well, as long as you keep blocking the light, I'm okay. I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Katie. Welcome back to the Cowbell Kingdom podcast brought to you by Jiffy Lube. Jiffy Lube, fast and convenient automotive services with over 25 locations in the area. Visit them at jiffylubeca.com for coupons and locations today. I am James Ham. Joining me in this second portion of the Cowbell Kingdom podcast is Mr. Aaron Bruski. Aaron, what's going on, man? I don't know, man. I think I got to take a shower after watching that Kings game. That was pretty ugly. That was filthy. You're right. A shower is needed. Sacramento Kings lose on Wednesday night, 102 to 89. Of course, we are going to record this podcast on Wednesday, not Thursday, where we typically do because tomorrow's Thanksgiving and uh, we want to be with our families as much as you want to be with your families. Filthy, filthy, disgusting game. What are your thoughts on Ramon Sessions? Because I've gone off a little bit myself, but I, I want to hear your thoughts on Ramon Sessions. I mean, I don't know. He could possibly be suffering from an injury that we don't know about or something having to do with his explosion. He doesn't look incredibly slow, but the man has lost the ability to dribble. And Mike Malone kind of he hinted in, about this in the post game. Getting separation is almost it's an art as, as well as a science. You have to use your body to kind of body the guy off you, change directions to keep him off you so these passing lanes aren't so difficult. But between passing lanes and defensive pressure, I, I can't see – I mean, he, he's putting the ball down once and it's getting taken away. So let alone three or four dribbles, it's just a mess. So I don't know what's wrong with him. Yeah, Sessions has been listed on the injury report for the last two games with a sore knee. I think he has a knee strain and uh, so maybe he has a little bit of an explosion issue. But let's be honest here. This has been an entire season. I mean, we're looking at 15 games now, and it's still a small sample size, but it's decision-making. As much as it is him, like, literally just handing the ball over and and, and fumbling the ball, I mean, that's what we saw tonight. I mean, I made that, that ridiculous comment about he was going to have his hands checked for butter at halftime. Um, I, on Twitter, but that's what it was, right? I mean, the guy just could not hold on to the ball. The thing that kills me, though, is that he just, like, he picks up his dribble all the time, and then he's stuck, and he's picking it up at, like, the most... As soon as he gets real pressure, he just picks the ball up, and you're like, okay, wait, aren't you a point guard? What exactly is happening here? So I think the levels of disappointment with... Uh, with Mr. Ramon Sessions are, are like deep. And I, I think Michael Malone is going to have to start making a very, very difficult decision here with, with regards to him and Ray McCallum. Uh, I will point out that the Kings can't do anything with Sessions until December 22nd. Typically it is, uh, it's December 15th before you can trade a free agent that you've signed in the off season. But because they signed Sessions so late at September 22nd, it's 90 days or December 15th, whichever comes later. And so they can't deal them until December 22nd. Not that I think that they're like rapid fire are going to deal them as soon as the date hits, but they might. You never know. He needs to find somewhere where he fits better because as of right now, he doesn't fit here at all. And the Kings need a defensive-minded guy. They need a 3 and D guy, right, at, at the backup point guard position. And that's not what Sessions is even remotely. I think it speaks to the situation that you're even looking up dates and times for when he could be possibly dealt yeah, or painful. waived. It's That's really bad. And, you know, this is Malone just – he doesn't want to crush him. You know this because he played about as terribly as a basketball player can play tonight. And Malone stuck with him, and he did have McCallum basically ready to go. And McCallum definitely deserves the backup point guard job right now. That's not a question in my mind. But you have this guy. You paid decent, uh, decent, somewhat decent money for him. 
So you don't want to lose him. And, and he's, I don't know, he's definitely lost right now because he's making the types of mistakes that people make when they're pressing and it's all worst case scenario type thing. But if the Kings don't address this, first of all, Darren Collis and anything happens to him, you can just rule the playoffs out. Uh, I think they need a backup uh, playmaker no matter what, even if Collison stays healthy for 82 games or however many games he could stay healthy for. So they got a couple issues. We know they're going to be aggressive whenever they see the opportunity. So, uh, you know, I think Kings fans can look to the trade deadline and, and hope they can pick up an additional piece. All right. We, we don't want to harp on the Kings too bad because they have won three of their last four. They had a three-game win streak snap tonight. They are, uh, what is it, 9-6 and six on the season. They may improve to 10-5 and five on the season at some point. If uh, around December 2nd, if the league does make some radical move and overturn a win for the Memphis Grizzlies. But uh, this team has been playing extremely well. And there's another guy who isn't getting all of the, the props in the world for what he's done. And you're an outside observer looking in, uh, you know, on this team, Aaron. So I want to hear what what your thoughts are on what Jason Thompson has been able to do on the defensive end specifically. I think like with a lot of these guys, the the bar is pretty low. You know, like let I, I don't want to switch gears off of off of JT, but you know, look at like Ben McLemore. The fact that he can get his feet set and hit a bunch of threes, everybody's really excited about that. Jason Thompson kind of falls in the same category. He was really, really, really bad last year defensively on his rotations. Uh offensively he was lost. Um kind of a guy that just just kind of miscast in his own eyes and then in, in the way that he's deployed. He never really gets into a rhythm, but this year he's been super focused on his role. Uh, I don't know if something clicked in the offseason. He didn't seem very happy, um, but he's playing no. like a guy that's happy, and he's defensively up the ante quite a bit. Uh, he still makes a good solid number of bad plays and I don't want to overlook that stuff because I think I've seen some people say, well, this guy could be getting defensive player of the year or um, first team, second team, third team defensive. No, no, no. We're not talking about that. Yeah. I mean, uh, maybe, maybe he is consideration for like third team or an honorable mention, but yeah, you're right. You're right. I think he would have to continue in a a higher level of play than he's at right now, which is possible. He could improve to that. Um, but he would have to continue that for the rest of the season to get into that lofty territory in my book. But yeah, I mean, this is a part of the Kings coming together and it's um, kind of been touching on this everywhere I talk and everywhere I write. It's DeMarcus Cousins is making the game exponentially easier for everybody on the team. So a guy like Jason Thompson, when you've got DeMarcus Cousins playing so well defensively, you can kind of freelance a little bit more and, pick and choose some matchups that are really good for him. Like, for instance, that Anthony Davis matchup, he actually matches up quite well with him. So we've seen him shine, and it's good for him. I think he's one of the guys in Sacramento that kind of goes under the radar for being kind of a good community guy, good team guy. So it's good to see him get some uh, get some dap. Yeah, I definitely agree, especially Anthony Davis. I mean, Anthony Davis, there will come a time where Anthony Davis is – literally the greatest basketball player in the game. At least I think there there's going to come a time. I'm not well, What was not, crazy was Cousins was making Cousins made him look bad. Yeah, that was the yeah. crazy part about that. So, well, not to step on your toes. No, you're all right. You're all right. I firmly believe that right now DeMarcus Cousins is the best big man in the game. And I think Anthony Davis is right there behind him. And there will come a time 2 or 3 years from now where maybe Anthony Davis is the best big man in the game. But right now, I'm I, it's to me, it's DeMarcus Cousins. The way that he's able to do things, contort his body, do all of these things. You put out a tweet tonight, didn't you, about uh, an ESPN science, uh, the sports science? Yeah, I don't know how he makes these shots. It's yeah. absolutely crazy. He'll have three guys on him. The ball looks like it's coming out from his armpit, and he's still making these shots at a very efficient rate. So I, I don't know. He's and, and that's the offensive side. I get less impressed with that because we've seen that for the last year or so out of him. It's the defensive side that's making this team. I readjusted my win total on these guys. I got them over 40. Uh-oh. As long as the core three stay healthy, I got them over 40 wins. Did you see Hollinger? Uh, not, yeah, the Hollinger prediction. Uh, they, they list the Kings at like 89.3% playoff team, uh, 4.6% like championship team. Um, they – so far, the ratings have them winning like 52 games, I think it was, 52 and 30. And, I mean, that's shocking. It's shocking. I, I, I tweeted about this. I don't think the league plays enough back-to-the-basket big men anymore. I think that 
teams don't know how to double team DeMarcus Cousins. That's one thing I haven't seen uh, done to the Kings very well by many teams. So maybe that'll change. You know, these, these guys will see the Kings once, see them twice, and they'll figure out you have to get this guy on the catch. You cannot let him get moving to the hoop. Uh, if your double team is late or it's early, if it's early, he's going to skip pass. And, you know, Ben McLemore has been draining threes like it's nobody's business. So he's got the the full package and teams have to be disciplined in how they double, but they just don't see enough of it. And I don't think that they're sharp. Yeah, I, you might be onto something there that they, they just aren't used to a big man like this. But at the same time... I, I don't think that that's ever going to change. I don't. I mean, you put him up against Omir Ashik, who is like the elite post defender in the game at the at the center position. I mean, his his defensive numbers, what he's done for the last couple of years, is just like shocking. And the fact that he was able to start in fast times at Richmond High in like 1983 <laughs> at the same time is he's ageless. Yeah, he is ageless. He is ageless. I mean, we don't. It's shocking. It's shocking what Demarcus Cousins did to him. What I liked about it is we talked about this early in the season about the way that Demarcus Cousins was sort of chained to the basket, and he had mentioned that it was Tyrone Corbin's plan to stick him close to the basket and keep him there. But what he was able to do was uh, hit a couple of jumpers and then draw a sheik outside, run right by a sheik, go and go right at the rim and score. And then he, once he, he got took him, him to bounce, the woodshed, he did. Man. He took him to the woodshed. It was like everything inside, outside, double teams, triple teams. I have not seen anything like that. That front court is the elite front court in the NBA. It is, and isn't he, it? And he just made them look like little kids. And that's Anthony Davis out there. I, I'm just, sh- I'm, I'm. That shocked me a little bit. Was how easily he sort of neutralized that strength of the the Pelicans. Yeah, uh, what he goes at, like, the best post defender and the number one shot blocker in the game right now in Anthony Davis, and he just eats them alive. They have no chance against him. On their home floor, I mean, they, they the Kings own that game. That was extremely impressive. Without their starting point guard, without Rudy Gay, their starting small forward, shocking, absolutely shocking. Uh, that- uh- Oh, oh so I, I was gonna say that's the game. I think if you're if you're a denier that he's in the MVP discussion, or perhaps maybe you're just too slow to watch, you know, get get around to watching some Sacramento Kings games. That's the game where it all kind of comes together because you don't see any fall off with two of the three main cogs off the floor. That that to me, with the plus minuses that you see with Cousins on and off the floor, all of the stats, all of the the eye tests that you could possibly have, that's an MVP candidate without a doubt. Yeah, he passes the, the smell test. Yeah, you're just like watching him like, holy cow, I can't believe what we're watching. And again, you brought up the MVP. Uh, you know, early, early season, he's got to be in the conversation. Uh, he, he definitely has to be in the conversation. He's certainly an all-star. I mean, I think, you know, right now, Aaron, we have to start booking our flights to New York for All-Star Weekend. Uh, because Back to New York. Back, yeah, we've been to New York together. That's right. The Board of Governors, the BOG. Yes. Uh, yeah, I am excited to be in New York again because I love New York. Um, and All-Star Weekend is elongated this year, so it's going to be a little bit longer. You have some time. I think it's a seven-day window as opposed to like the three-day window. So the players are going to get a break, uh, which means I can spend a little, more t- a little bit more time in New York. You can spend a little bit more time in New York. It's a good thing. Uh, and, and for that matter, I mean, it's pretty clear that Ben McLemore will make the rookie, uh, the rookie challenge, the rookie sophomore game as part of the sophomore team. Uh, there's an outside chance here that Rudy Gay is an all-star as well. He's played extremely extremely well this season and without Kevin Durant in the Western Conference I I mean you have a hard time telling me that he's not the best small forward in in the West and if the Kings continue to win I mean I keep talking about this on again other platforms but the month of December the Sacramento Kings have 11 home games out of 15 total games and of those those four road games two of them are against the Lakers and the Golden State Warriors and so most of the whole month of December is close. Eight games against the Eastern Conference. The eight, the Eastern Conference has like what, like, f- like three teams with a winning road record, something like that. It's ridiculous. It, it's not good. I mean, the the Eastern Conference is weak sauce. The the Kings' schedule is weak sauce. There's a very good opportunity for the Kings to walk out of December with uh, plus twenty uh, wins already, with three and a half months left in the season, and that's something that. Kings fans should be excited about. I mean, you got to be a little bit scared because these last three games, 
uh, to end November and you know going into December are absolutely brutal still. But this is something that I, I the Kings fans just haven't been able to get for a long time. This this promising start, this holy cow, maybe you got something type deal. That's and, the best way to put it right there is that maybe we got something. Yeah, maybe we got something. You know, I, I know that uh, Devin Blankenship, shout out to Devin, uh, who was one of the media relations guys for the Kings for a long time before the new regime came in. Um, anyway, Devin had mentioned on Twitter the other night that this team reminded him not of the Weber, Divock, uh, Jason Williams, you know, John Barry, not that team, Pages Stoyakovich, not that team, but of the previous team that had made the playoffs after a 10-year drought in the 95-96 season, which was Mitch Richmond, Brian Grant, Olden Polonese, uh, Michael the Animal Smith, you know, sort of a knockdown dragout, uh, Sharunis Marshallonis, you know, a team that just came out and fought you all game long. I think they added Billy Owens in that season. They had Lionel Simmons. I think that was Lionel Simmons' last season as a professional. Um, sort of a, a gutsy, dirty, grind-you-out team, and that this team reminded him of that team more than of, you know, something like the Weber, the Weber Divock era. And uh, Aaron, is there a team that this, that this group reminds you of? Uh, yeah, it's the, the, the uh, Los Angeles Lakers, to be honest. Um, the, the, the Shaq like dominance of DeMarcus Cousins is just, just to me, like the, I haven't seen this out of the, po- the low post in a very long time. Um, trying to think of the last low post player that that's been like this where you you just can't cover him with two or three guys and I think you have to go all the way back to Shaquille and so they run different systems obviously but you're talking about guys like Rudy Gay he's he's not you know he's definitely not Kobe Bryant but he's able to operate in great space and that's the same thing with Darren Carlson he's able to operate in one-on-one coverage in great space whether it's pick and roll or isolation and Ben Macklemore god I wish we had more time to talk about that guy the light bulb turning on for him has just been just been amazing and he's getting now to play in favorable situations whereas in the past you know it's it's hard when the guy's pressed up on you to be a rookie in this league and be able to get your feet underneath you and get off a good shot. And so that's what we saw last year. That's what we saw early this year. But now that everything's coalescing around Cousins, he's able to get a guy running at him, go right around him and start to get some penetration. We're seeing him actually making shots on the run. So it, they kind of remind me of the Lakers, but you know, different systems. It's not Kobe Bryant. So I don't know what your, what your, your listeners will think of all that. I think that that, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, again, you're talking about a dominant big man and a, a big man that's so dominant that there's nothing you can do. It doesn't matter how many you throw at him. You know, I think like people could say, well, what about the Spurs and Tim Duncan? And it's such a different type of feel what Cousins brings. I mean, Duncan, you know, will kill you with that uh, sort of daggers in your heart again and again every time he hits a little bank shot from 18 feet. And you're like, oh, God, I can't do anything about it. You know, it doesn't matter how high you can jump. It doesn't matter how close you are to him. He is a little fade, and he hits glass, and, you know, the bank is always open for Tim Duncan. But uh, you're right, Shaquille O'Neal, the way that he was just a force. Now, I'm going to point out the one huge difference that I that I see between these two players. Um, DeMarcus Cousins tonight, 11 of 13 from the foul stripe. Yes. And that's something that, my goodness, the Kings, uh, again, 22 of 28, 79% from the free throw line. They're shooting over 80% as a team on the season. They're leading the league in most free throw attempts. And it's one of those deals where people are asking, is that sustainable or is that not? And for me, I say yes, it is sustainable because I believe that they have the type of players that are aggressive, that are forcing the action that are getting themselves to the line, not as opposed to, uh, you know, teams, again, like Houston. Houston tonight, 6 of 15 from the line, which is just abysmal. I can't believe they shot 6 of 15 from the line, but only 15 free throws, and it's because they weren't the aggressor. And, uh, you know, for those free throws, you can just wipe off the board because they were the Kings fouling Joey Dorsey just to get him to miss all four of his free throws. So, I mean, a team goes... Realistically, it could have been 6 of 11 from the line. 
and that just shows you the difference in style, the way that the Kings are playing is so aggressive. But is that sustainable in your opinion? Well, you know what's the scary thing here is DeMarcus Cousins' stats are all practically facsimiles of last season with the exception of free throw percentage. He's hitting at about an 80% better clip than he was last year. Who knows? That might not be sustainable. Free throw numbers don't tend to to jump quite that high. Um, but the rest of his game is all operating within the same statistical confine as last year. What you're seeing is a cleaner version, but what it means for Kings fans is He's actually, when, when he takes yet another step forward, because the Kings are going to, be, to become even better at getting him the ball, refs are going to start giving him more calls. There will be, and, and conversely, there will be a Shaq effect where they don't let, you know, they, they kind of pick on the big man and let him get beat up a little bit. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. He's doing things that we haven't seen him do last year, you know, kind of of the wow variety. Um, just because he's continuously improving, but there's more ceiling here statistically and in terms of impact on the floor. So I am, I'm a little shocked his numbers aren't higher, but pretty soon I think they're going to start going gadzooks. Yeah, it has a lot to do with his inability to stay on the floor. I mean, he's only averaging right around 31 and a half minutes a game. That's coming up it's slowly, he, but he does still have issues with, uh, with foul trouble and that will limit him. You know, tonight he plays 37 minutes, uh, but he did it with five fouls. The turnover numbers are still, you know, outlandish. But uh, but it's something that we're getting to see the like the development of a superstar, watching a superstar blossom in front of your eyes. And once he does stay on the floor, I mean, he does lead the league in rebounding right now. He pads out again tonight with 17 boards. Uh, you know, he's he's such a an incredible talent to watch such an outlier such something that we haven't seen um, that I think is really it's really cool to watch and to cover and to watch him grow as a person as well because that I, that is happening um, I, I couldn't have said that you know four months ago three months ago I see it now I do and he's much much more mature he is learning from his mistakes he's allowing Michael Malone to take the abuse and and go get those texts and get thrown out of games when you know there's an injustice and I like that Malone is sort of cognizant of that and doing that for Cousins but I think we're on to something. I think that's, you know, at the end of the day, that's what I think you can kind of say that the Kings are on to something. Hey, there's another player that's that's really, he's, he's sort of rounding into shape and he's impressing every single time he's out there. Have you got to watch enough of Omri Caspi to know if what he's doing is legitimate or if this is an aberration that he's a guy that, uh, you know, again, may flame out any time now? Well, I will tell your listeners that I watch every single second of every single Kings game, so I have seen plenty of Omri Caspi. My initial thought when I see him is, who is this guy? Because he looks a little bit bigger, he looks a little bit faster. Uh, you know, it's actually on the um, New Orleans Bourbon Street Shots podcast, and these guys kind of saw what happened when he was in New Orleans. He didn't want to be there. Um, so he's comfortable in Sacramento. And that's really big. I don't know if I think back when he was here, he said that there was like one place he could get good hummus. So they must have really good hummus. Um, but he's, he's playing and he's playing at this level where his, he's always been an aggressive player, but he's got the shot making and the shooting to make up for it. Now I'm a little bit concerned that he can't keep up his current pace. Cause I think he's shooting at like, I want to say like 52% from the field, um, hitting a lot of his free throws and and those numbers are way higher. You know, he's hitting about 54% of his shots and 85% from the line. And he's a career 68% foul shooter and a career 42.5% shooter from the field. So like this, this uh, associated swoon that he's about to have, because he will have it because the law of large numbers will kick in and he will be forced to, to miss a lot of shots at some point here. That might get a little frustrating for fans. But I do think that he provides the toughness that you want out of a guy in the second unit. He's providing that uh, energy. And so between him and Carl Landry, you have the pieces for a nice bench 
wouldn't be a bad idea or you know something to look at to maybe move Jason Thompson into some of those bench minutes. He could still start him, but shift him into the bench because they're really, really lacking in that area. Uh, New Orleans has a very bad bench, and that was, I think, one of the reasons that the Kings were able to win that game. But if they go up against any team that's got a really strong bench, this is where the Kings get up by 10, 20 points, and then they lose that lead, and it's back on Cousins to get them up ahead again. All right, so I'm going to counter something that you... I mean, I agree. Like, the uh, Caspi's actually coming into tonight was shooting 54% from the field, which is ridiculous. Caspi's never, ever even come close to that. His best career season besides that was 44.6% during his rookie season with the Sacramento Kings. So I buy that. But the reason why I think that he's still going to shoot 50-plus percent from the field is because he stopped taking stupid shots. And he's I, taking them tonight. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, what was he, 7 of 11? Yeah, I mean, he finishes 7 of 11 from the field. His, his field goal percentage went up. I think he, he got into it a little bit with Trevor Ariza. And yes, that, he got a little he, hot. He, he got a little hot, so he took a couple shots there I didn't like. But, yeah, he had a pretty good night. And definitely you don't want to ride Omri Caspi right now because he's one of the good guys as far as performing on the court. Yeah, I think the the – what Omri's done is, even in a game like tonight, this is where I could have seen him make some really bad plays. Uh, I thought he might go into Houston and regress to Omri Caspi, the three-point shooter, which he did last year, which is what they asked him to do, right? They, last year, I, I think he averaged uh, something like, oh, there it is, 2.5 three-pointers per game. This year, he's at .8. He's barely shooting anything from the outside. More than that, he hasn't taken a single mid-range jumper. When we saw him as a young player, all he did was pull up for 18-foot jumpers. He he has a lightning-quick first step. He's got long arms. He's 6'9". Six, six, He's got massive speed. We're seeing him run the ball right at people and right down people's necks. And I think it's really interesting to watch because I do actually believe that what he's doing is sustainable. Where I'm confused... This is where I think I, I really have had had it with Ramon Sessions. Is that Ramon Sessions, what he's based his career around is kind of like what Tyreek Evans does, right? Going at the rim, going at the rim, going at the rim. And all of a sudden, you got DeMarcus Cousins, you got Carl Landry in there, and you can't go at the rim anymore because things are a little cluttered. Well, how is it that a guy like Omri Caspi has reinvented himself and he can go at the rim, but a guy like Ramon Sessions, who has done that his entire career, can't do it? And I don't have the answer for you, but I definitely know that the Kings are a very good team when Omri Caspi's on the floor. I, I see Omri finishing a lot of games down the stretch. I think that they will use a sort of the, the big lineup where they go, uh, they move Gay over to the power with Cousins and, and Caspi and Ben McLemore and Collison, and we won't see a lot of Jason Thompson in the fourth quarter. I think that's something we might see. And you're right. I I mean, is he going to shoot 85% from the line when he's a career 68% shooter from the line? Probably not. So regression is understandable, but he's staying within himself, and he's really, really giving Malone great minutes off the bench, which, I, I mean, who knew? I mean, this guy is signed for less than the league minimum. You know that, right? Oh yeah, <laughs> he's he's a he's an incredible asset for the Kings. You know, it's back to your Ramon Sessions thing because I think that's really pressing. Because um, McCallum, while I like McCallum a lot, he's got to be able to bury the outside shot to be able to effectively run the offense. Yeah. If he if he he's not Rajon Rondo, you know, and even Rajon Rondo has a jumper now. So I think with Sessions, what you're seeing is there's been a lot of rev- revisionist history about how the summer played out and how. You know, Collison was always the number one guy on their radar, and that really wasn't the case. Sessions was built was like a backup plan. He was the guy in case Collison didn't work out with with a somewhat proven track record that people could get behind. But he's not a good fit, as you alluded to. He needs a lot of space. He needs high pick and roll. He needs you know shooters surrounding him. He needs to be going against second unit guys and and really. That's where he's been effective for the bulk of his career. He's not getting that with Cousins and, and Landry in the middle. And for a guy of his height, he really needs to be able to beat a guy and and have a clear path to the hoop to be able to do the damage. But unfortunately, he can't even make those shots right now. So I think um, 
you know, the Kings going to have to figure that out. Who's going to be the playmaker in the second unit that can handle the ball and set it up when Cousins isn't on the floor? Yeah, and I think it should be pointed out, too, that, uh, I mean, in all fairness, while Ben McLemore is sort of having his awakening moment, his his big sort of coming out party, that uh, we're seeing some some major struggles out of out of Nick Stauskas in the second unit. And, and so you have to feel for Sessions a little bit because he is playing alongside a rookie who has no idea what he's doing. They're both piss poor defenders at this point in their careers uh sessions because i don't think he tries and um and stauskas because he just doesn't know what to do yet and for as good as ben mclemore has been you know the guy's shooting 46.8 percent from the field he's shooting 42.6 from three-point line he's still only averaging 10 points a game i mean he's not like blowing up i mean his per 36 number is 11.8 points per 36 he he's not having this like takeoff. He's just giving you more confidence than what you saw last year. And he's also he's kind of back on track because I think a lot of Kings fans went, oh boy, you know this guy's lost and he's not going to be any good. Uh, he you know he doesn't have great hands. He doesn't have great handles. But I I don't know. Malone seems to have him in a in a good place, a place where he can succeed. Where I think Sessions is coming in and he's getting you know Stauskas alongside him most of the time. And Stauskas is struggling. He is. I mean, tonight, some wide open shots where it's like, come on, man. You know, if they're going to get you that wide open, you have to hit it. I think he hit one three, finishes with like seven points. But at the same time, I mean, he had two or three other wide open looks that, you know, he's even got a little gun shy. And that's not what you can have in the second unit, especially when you have a guy like Sessions who needs driving lanes and, and they're collapsing. So, I, I, you know, again, I think we're seeing... Um, zone defenses against the second unit, which really hurts Sessions. I think we're seeing a lot of other things that can happen. But when he does get the opportunity, like tonight, I mean, it's pretty bitter disappointment. We shouldn't have a game where, you know, yesterday 15 points, 6 assists against the Pelicans, and you come back the next night and it's like 8 points and, and 5 turnovers and you're just outlandishly bad and, and everyone's looking at it around going, uh, why is he on the court? So, all right, Aaron, let's move on to something else. Uh, before we go, um, I, I want to, you know, let's talk general NBA for just a second. And we're looking at a Houston Rockets team because the Kings just face the Houston Rockets. Houston Rockets are now, what, 12-3 and three on the season. They're absolutely killing it, and they're doing it without, like tonight, no Patrick Beverly, no uh, Terrence Jones, no big man in the middle, no uh, no Howard. How is it that this team is succeeding when James Harden is their quote-unquote star? Because I don't buy James Harden as a star, not as a superstar, and I don't buy Dwight Howard as a true superstar in the league. How is Houston doing this? I will give you that in under 10 seconds. Wins over the Lakers, Jazz, Celtics, Sixers, the Heat, who aren't that good. A good quality win over the Spurs, who probably didn't care. The Wolves, who are not good. The Sixers, once again, who are terrible. The Thunder, who have like seven players. The Mavs, who are pretty good. The Knicks, who suck. And then he got they got a win over Sacramento without their two of their three best players tonight. That's how Houston's doing it. That's dropping the mic right there. Boom. Yeah. Boom. Done. I mean, but they've shown <laughs> they've shown some good signs. I, I like Trevor Ariza as a uh, defensive upgrade. Uh, they don't need any more scoring. Um, though I'll say this: this this Dwight Howard knee thing does not look good. Um, Maybe, just maybe, you know, it just is one of those things where it, the smoke is outweighing what's, you know, really going on there. But the fact that he's having this kind of a problem this early in the season and they don't seem to have control over it makes me a little bit uneasy because if he goes, obviously they go nowhere. Um, and then Terrence Jones. I mean, the guy couldn't feel his toes as recently as like two weeks ago. So uh they've got some serious problems that's why they're going to bring al harrington in i don't know if that's been announced and confirmed yet but he um cut out of his chinese contract and he was going to be an assistant coach as far as like this last summer goes and so that's the kind of you know i think desperacy they have there so yeah i would look at the houston rockets with a bit of skepticism early on yeah because al harrington is going to fix all all cure all ills yeah I'm, i'm not i'm confused there all right so lastly we we always like to do a little fantasy flavor uh, if people don't have Isaiah Can- uh, Cannon, then I-, I assume that they should pick him up. But in most leagues, he's probably already picked up. Well, what else you got for us? I don't know. I think I gave you guys KJ McDaniel's. He yep. had a really good night. Um, 
Oh, geez, this is a tough one. Um, all right, we'll go Chris Humphreys. Why what? not? Chris what? Humphreys, because Nene has at least three injuries right now, and you're looking for a guy that has a little bit of upside. You're in a competitive league, maybe with 12 to 14 owners. He didn't have a great game tonight, but he's been able to produce top 100 upside in the past when he's been given 25 or more minutes per game. So I don't think that he did great tonight. But, you know, what? I don't like to come at you guys with, like, you know, Mr. Obvious, say, like, Mo Williams when – uh, Ricky Rubio went down. You know, give you somebody that's under the radar that you could keep an eye on. Maybe don't drop somebody with great value for him, but just keep an eye on him. And and if he starts to pick it up, pick him up. Hmm. Interesting. M- miss, uh, the former Mr. Kardashian. Interesting. Um, Break the internet, baby. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I uh, I actually saw him in Cancun, uh, running on the beach the uh, the weekend when. Um, I think when Kim Kardashian, something big was happening with her. She got married or something. She, something crazy was going on with her. Uh, he was running on the beach in uh, in Cancun while I was there. So uh, so good for him. And uh, and it is he is a guy who's always giving you rebounds and and actually decent scoring, although he's limited. Decent scoring per minute. Uh, he's he's always been a quality stat filling guy. All right, Aaron, I think that's going to do it for this edition of the Cowbell Kingdom podcast. Do you have anything else for me? Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Go hug somebody and, and, and try to be with your family and take a day off maybe from hoops because there's no games tomorrow night. What? It's all football all day long. All right, well, that is going to do it for this edition of the Cowbell Kingdom podcast brought to you by Jiffy Lube. Jiffy Lube, fast and convenient automotive services with over 25 locations in the area. Visit them at JiffyLubeCA.com for coupons and locations today. They are awesome. Make sure to get to your local Jiffy Lube as soon as possible to make sure your car will take you where it needs to go for your holiday weekend. For Aaron Bruski, I am James Ham. You have been listening to the Cowbell Kingdom podcast. We will be back next week. Make sure to leave us some feedback, especially on iTunes. Uh, Give us some positive ratings. And that's going to do it for this episode. Have a good uh, Thanksgiving, everyone out there in Kingsland.